Around 400 BC, an ancient Greek philosopher named Democritus first proposed the idea that matter was made of indivisible particles called atoms. Now, this is considered an idea rather than a theory because it is not supported by experimental evidence. So he was one of the very first people to propose that matter was made up of these smaller particles. Also around this same time, they thought that all of matter existed as four basic elements, fire, air, water, and earth. One of the first scientists to begin studying the properties of matter was Antoine Lavoisier, and in 1789 he proposed the law of conservation of mass. What he did is he took this apparatus here and he burned phosphorus and sulfur, and he found that the products of the combustion weighed more than the reactants, but that that weight was equally lost by the surrounding air. So he was able to figure out that even though the reactants weighed more than what he started with, they gained mass that was equal to what the air lost. And so that led him to propose the law of conservation of mass. The mass is not created or destroyed during a chemical reaction or a physical change. So no matter what changes matter goes through, it always stays constant. It always stays the same as far as the amount or quantity of matter that's present. Because of his studies, he has been coined the father of chemistry by many modern-day scientists. Here's a diagram of what the law of conservation of mass looks like. Notice here we have one methane molecule. Now one methane is composed of one carbon, those are the little black circles, and four hydrogens, which are the white circles. When methane is burned, it reacts with two oxygen molecules. An oxygen that you breathe it always comes in pairs. So there's two oxygen atoms there, that makes up one oxygen molecule. And here's another two oxygen atoms here, making up another oxygen molecule. So one methane reacts with two oxygen molecules. The oxygen actually breaks up that methane molecule and two of the oxygens combine with the carbon and the other two oxygens combine with each of the hydrogens. So if you count, there are four hydrogens before the reaction and there are four hydrogens after the reaction. There are four oxygens before the reaction and there are four oxygens after the reaction. And there's one carbon before the reaction and one carbon after the reaction. So matter was not created or destroyed. It was simply separated and rearranged and shuffled back together in some other combination. The law of definite proportions was first studied by Joseph Proust in 1794. He's an English chemist, and he proposed that chemical compounds always contain the same elements in the same proportions regardless of their sample size and regardless of their source. So last chapter we talked about sucrose. Sucrose has the chemical formula C12H22O11 and has the structural formula as seen here. And we discussed how it doesn't matter where you get the sucrose from, right? Whether the sucrose comes from cane sugar or whether it comes from beet sugar, it will always have the exact same composition because it's a compound. All compounds, like sucrose, have a constant composition regardless of the amount of sucrose you have or the source that it came from. The law of multiple proportions was first observed by John Dalton in 1803. This law states that two elements can combine in different whole number ratios to form different compounds. So down here I have an example of nitrogen can combine with oxygen to make something called nitrogen monoxide. But nitrogen can also combine with two oxygens to form something called nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen and oxygen can combine together in different ratios to form different compounds. They don't always have to stay in the exact same proportions. Now each of these compounds, nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide, will actually have their own unique chemical properties that depend on those ratios. Now all of these discoveries, the law of multiple proportions, the law of definite proportions, the law of conservation of mass, John Dalton took all of these and in 1808 he proposed his atomic theory. The first aspect of his atomic theory is that all matter is made up of indivisible atoms, so the atoms cannot be broken down into smaller parts. He said that atoms of one element are identical. So if you had an atom of oxygen, it would have the exact same size, the exact same mass, the exact same properties, regardless of where you got that element from. 
The third part of John Dalton's atomic theory was that atoms of different elements have different properties. And so these over here on the right were the main elements that were present around the time of Dalton. If you went back to ancient Greek times, there were four elements. In John Dalton's time, we had increased the number of elements to ten. They called them hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, and so on. And Dalton made up these different symbols to represent those elements. But that hydrogen has different properties than nitrogen. And carbon has different properties of phosphorus. But remember, one phosphorus, according to Dalton, would have the exact same size, mass, and properties as any other phosphorus element. He said that atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to make compounds. So think about the law of multiple proportions. The ratio between nitrogen and oxygen was always one to one. And in nitrogen dioxide, it was always one to two. But those ratios always had to be whole numbers because the atoms are whole, indivisible particles. The last part of Dalton's atomic theory was that in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged, but they are not created or destroyed. And that was simply stating Lavoisier's law of conservation of mass. Now highlighted here in red are the two parts of Dalton's atomic theory that we have since revised. So since we've learned more and had more evidence, we've gone back and revised the concept that all matter is made up of indivisible atoms. We'll learn this chapter that those atoms can actually be broken down into smaller parts. We'll learn in the next section that atoms of one element can actually have different masses from each other, so they're not completely identical.